Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Michelle said, my name is Catherine Moulton. I'm the Assistant Director of Compliance Planning at the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. Um, I work within the Reef Joint Field Management Program, which means I'm across the Reef Authority and Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service as well. Um, now, my role includes a variety of functions, including uh, research and technology for compliance. Uh, um, and um, just before I kick off further, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which um, I am today, the Wurrukpa and Bindal people, as well as um, for all the locations where these projects have occurred or will occur. Now, um, there's a variety of projects to be presented today, um, all within the Great Barrier Reef uh, region, some extend beyond, and all associated with recreational fishing in various ways in either understanding um, recreational fishing, changing behaviour, um, the systems um, and technologies associated with it, um, improving um, our side of it and how we communicate or how we interact with recreational fishers as well, or do our daily business. Some of these projects are ones that um, we funded um, ourselves or, or within the Reef Authority um, or have been involved in or collaborated with um, or just have an interest um, in there's, um, as I mentioned, various projects and um, a whole lot of really interesting ones. So hopefully uh, we should be able to maintain your attention here today. Um, now in thinking about this um, project uh, or, or sort of this session today, um, I was up at the Reef Fleet Terminal in Cairns uh, yesterday and I'm I often go up there when I'm in Cairns. It's the location where all of the tourism operators um, depart from for the day. Uh, they take visitors out to the reef and um, I find it a really uh, good thing to do to, to go there in the mornings when I'm up there to see the hustle and bustle of the location and to connect with um, what it is to be a tourism operator and um, in that experience that I used to have being in the tourism industry but also to see um, recreational visitors going out to the park and often experiencing it, experiencing it for the first time. And so it's important um, for me to maintain that connection and as a managing agency to, to kind of maintain that um, understanding and awareness of um, the people who we're managing. Um, and, um, you know, we're all still learning um, because behaviour is quite complex as um, we'd often know. And in the compliance space and in fisheries management more broadly, um, the key is really uh, trying, is really um, managing the people. Uh, in compliance specifically, you're really trying to shift behaviour. So there is the legislation that we have, um, which sets a minimum standard. So as in you can't fish in green zones and things like that, or marine national park zones. And um, so we're really trying to shift behaviour often from people who have no idea about the rules and there's sort of an accidental element, but there's also people who may intentionally try and break the rules. And so that's a different um, action that you might need to take. And so there's quite a lot of understanding that you need to have to really try and shift and move behaviour. Um, and so there's definitely um, more that we can learn and understand and, and grow in being able to do that. Um, so there's a lot of different projects today to touch on. There'll be um, the NEST project that um, is been about understanding recreational fishing and communicating to that audience through communications campaigns. Uh, Tracy Mahoney at um, James Cook University um, will uh, chat to that with some of our Reef Authority staff um, and that's been also uh, through the University of Tasmania as well. There's a lot of great projects for QDAF, um, Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. I won't run through them all now, they can uh, chat to them, but they range from, you know, understanding visitation and use, understanding recreational fishes, um, as well as trying to shift behaviour and trying to um, really engineer some things from the start in where it's um, user friendly for that audience and we'll get the best result. Um, there's also a great project from Stuart about um, Stuart Jones at James Cook University about using experimental gains uh, to help understand non compliant um, fisheries behaviour, non compliant fishing behaviour. 
Um, we've seen the game, it's really exciting. So I'm keen for him to share that project, which builds on a lot of work um, Brock Burks has um, done previously. Um, and I think I've hit on all the projects. Um, oh, there's also the CSIRO project, um, which is an, a great collaboration that we've had to help us understand um, and build on um, our understanding of recreational fishing non-compliance through a variety of risk factors. They're specifically talking on spatial, temporal and social factors and what they tell us about the risk of recreational fishing non-compliance in the reef. Um, so we will uh, get into it. The presenters can all introduce themselves as well a bit more. Um, there will be two sessions and opportunities for questions after those sessions. So if you have questions after an individual presentation, if you could please leave it until the end of the session, that would be great. Thank you. Um, and I will hand it over to uh, Tracy Mahoney to uh, lead off on the first session as well. Hi everybody, I'm Tracy Mani. I'm a Marketing and Economics Discipline Lecturer from James Cook University. I'm here today to talk to you about a big team project that we've had, which is part of the National Environmental Science Program, um, evaluating recreational fisher use values and motivations that relate to compliance. Within that project, we've done a whole range of temporal things. We've looked at case studies in different locations around Australia, in marine parks that are new, ones that have been around for a while. Within that, we're looking and speaking today about a case study uh, that we partnered with the Great Barrier Reef for. And within that case study, we're just looking at the communications um, with a pilot campaign that we ran in conjunction with the team. Now, speaking of teams, from my team here today, we have Dr. Matt Navarro from the University of Western Australia. Give us a wave, Matt. And also Professor Natalie Stokel from the University of Tasmania. The rest of our team uh, would like to say a big hello to you from afar. They're traveling all over the place with different um, appointments at the moment, but their details are there. If you see anything about this project, because we're actually discussing you know, quite a refined, a big project within a, a little project within an aspect of that little project, um, please contact us. We're more than happy to have a chat to you about anything that we're presenting um, or any questions you might have outside of that. I'll just throw over to Kate. And Kate's going to explain how and why the, uh, the case study arose with them and what the interest was in the first place. Thanks, Tracy. So um, my name is Kate Hatton. I'm the Manager Compliance Projects at the Reef Authority for the Reef Joint Field management program. So as Tracy mentioned, I'm here just to provide a bit of um, context, I guess, for this project. Um, the compliance program works with our communications team uh, to raise awareness, improve voluntary compliance and educate rec fishers about Great Barrier Reef Marine Park zoning. Uh, this, this study uh, aimed to assist future compliance campaigns by identifying the sub archetypes of the 18 to 54 male group. Um, we assume that this was our target audience based on compliance intelligence data. Um, I guess, um, however, we, we understood that it wasn't a homogenous group. So basically not all rec fishers are the same. We had some predictability of the media consumption behaviours of our target audience. Um, we knew how to reach them and how they were getting their information. However, we were missing the psycho-behavioural profiles of Rec Fisher sub-archetypes that would assist in, I guess, developing, um, you know, effective messages in our campaigns in a way that would resonate with Rec Fishers and ultimately change their behaviour. So specifically, we wanted to make sure that we were talking to the right people with the right message in the right way, and I guess using those right metrics to measure um, compliance effectiveness. So our challenge was to shift from I guess the, the awareness phase to really influencing behaviour change. So rather than concentrating on whether compliance advertising was effective or not, our focus shifted to using social science to understand what elements of compliance advertising are more effective and for what user groups. And I guess we needed to know how to um, successfully measure that performance. And there appeared to be limited research um, tailored to address these specific problems. And I guess we, we needed not only the guidance in the practical sense, but also a detailed methodology to effectively bridge this gap. So this is what this project aimed to achieve. 
So back over to Tracy, who will take you through the project in detail. Okay, so the really cool part about this project and why I liked it so much was it was, gave us an ability as researchers to have a look at some theory, make a few tweaks and get our publications that we need. But it also kept us hands on with industry and show them that there is a real role for theory in a practical setting. So for those of you that are concerned about theory, um, yes, we used a, a um, theory of planned behaviour, which structured basically what we did throughout the project and helped us fill gaps between what we knew about our existing target market, what data was available through the compliance teams and, and various um, sources. And then we um, had to obviously go in and collect some primary data, which was done through online surveys and focus groups. The cool bit that I really liked because it uses a, a marketing tool and, and puts it into the theory of planned behavior, which is a pretty common um, behavioral theory, is we actually inserted an MPS scale, which is a net promoter scale um, as our proxy for behavioral intention. So yes, it's not perfect, but um, it, it actually worked, um, which was fabulous. Um, and it's the first time it's been tested in this type of way and in this context. We did have a lot of other theoretical structures that were within the theories and focus groups that we ran. We, um, in the background, had a big five factor model. We looked at Bandera's theory of self efficacy. We looked at Locke's motivational theory and also um, in, uh, constructs like social influence. Um, we also applied a CASA framework. So basically, everything um, that we had was structured into what we asked recreational fishers. Um, so everything was there for a purpose. At the end of the day, what we had in the, in the wash up was the ability to have a data set where we could look at it and segment it in a number of ways. I've got one of those ways up on the screen now, which was the formation of three basic fisher group types, which were people that like to fish alone for different reasons that you can read there. Um, people that fish with their friends or mates, um, and people that fished with family. So that's one way of looking at it. Another way you can see a Rubik's cube there um, um, above my uh, little pilot fish is to um, think about it in terms of what you maybe uh, are used to seeing in a, in a um, recreational fisher setting, which is factors around avidity or maybe catch and effort. This project was a little bit different because we had to assist a marketing team and a compliance team. So we needed to look at the data in a way which would inform message creation and also that provided observable characteristics for officers, for instance, when they're on the water and approaching recreational fishers. Uh, if you don't know what an MPA scale is, it's a common consumer uh, measure that gives a one to 10 scale, and then it um, categorizes those one to 10 scales into people into three categories, people that are promoters, detractors, and passives. It was pretty consistent across Australia with the areas that we looked at. Um, and the one on the screen there is um, specific to the GBR data set. Okay, I'm gonna throw over to Matt now, who's gonna tell you some exciting things about how, when, and why we ran the pilot. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Hopefully everyone can hear me. My internet is playing off a bit, so hopefully it's all good. Um, I won't spend too much time on this slide because um, Tracy's already sort of talked through the different segments, but essentially there were three. So we had our solo fisher. Um, so they're younger on average and less satisfied with the quantity and quality of fish they catch. And they're also less satisfied with the environment, environmental management of saltwater areas they fish in. Um, we also had our friends group. Um, so again, they fish with friends on average university educated and live in major cities. And then we had our family group as well. Um, so fish with family um, on average, not university educated and live local to the marine park. Um, so for the purposes of what we'll talk about today, the two segments that we did target were our friends and family. Um, so we didn't focus on a solo group and um, Tracy can probably better explain the reasons for that later. Uh, but essentially messages from an authority like the reef authorities wouldn't have hit the mark with them. They need more peer to peer messaging um, to really engage in that behavior change. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, so this is just a sample of the pilot ads that we ran. Um, so these, these are run on Meta um, from the 1st of May uh, to the end of May. And essentially this was testing a couple of different messages. So as you can see on screen, we had eight ads um, and four variations of the ads. 
Um, so the A variations were a more traditional messaging that we'd used in the past. So these are messages like fish the right zone, like know your zone, and our B variations were more emotional messaging. Uh, so these are things like fish for their future and love the reef. Um, and again, that's really trying to tie into that research that Tracy had done around what would be the most effective messaging for each of those target groups. Um, we also ran some advertising on YouTube uh, where we produced some videos. So one video targeted to each segment, one to the friends and one to the family, and also ran some display ads. But for the purposes um, of the study, we really focused on meta, just for how easy it is to, um, to build out those A-B tests um, and get some valid results. Um, and one of, the, one of the things we also did with this pilot is attach some, they're called UTM codes, so little snippets of code that you add to the end of an ad to basically track behavior on your website. Um, and this is really pushing into that behavior change space. So traditionally we'd focused on things like reach, like click-through rate. Um, so th they're sort of measures of engagement. We wanted to push that more to um, what people were actually doing. So things like visits to the page, things like whether they were downloading our app, downloading our maps, and this allowed us to do that and also to test which variation worked best um, to bring about that action. Um, the other thing to mention is we also had a media buyer involved, so UM. Um, so we essentially give them all the creative and they book it in for us. So they were also involved in monitoring some of the, the sentiment of the comments, um, which we'll also get to fairly shortly. But um, I'll throw back to Tracy um, to talk about some of those segments in a bit more detail. Okay. So what we did here um, is look for an anchor. So if you're, I know there's not a lot of business-based people in the audience today, but uh, ideally in a business environment, you have a business plan and within that sits a marketing plan and then you have different um, implementations. So everything is there for a reason, for a purpose, and you can track everything that you're doing. And that way, um, ideally, you get the best value out of the time and resources that you're putting into something. What we were looking for in this occasion was to link compliance because no one likes being told what to do. Um, that's pretty universal, right? So it's hard to make people love compliance. So what we needed to do was find an anchor and to anchor that into the main communications of the GBR. And when I went through and had a look at the last couple of years worth of their postings, I looked for things that had a lot of positive sentiment that were not charged in one way or the other in terms of any political um, entanglements or anything of that nature, just nice, pure things. The one that we ran with was Love the Reef. And the reason I ran with that one is because I wanted that association um, to occur between the act of compliance and the positive act for the reef. So that's why we've included um, that text in the first place. The know your, uh, know your right zone, we uh, sorry, know your zone was the previous text, and we just softened that slightly. Again, this is um, due to the uh, results that we had through the survey and also through our focus groups about how people felt and how fishers were feeling um, towards the department. We wanted to make those as, as positive um, for everyone as possible. So we've softened that up again and just put fish the right zone, okay, rather than the directive. Um, in, um, in a negative sort of um, consequential type way. So that's uh, what we did with those two. We've then given some recommendations to the team around how they approach messaging in the future. And you can see there from pulled through from our research to move them from a, an awareness-based campaign, which is general mass marketing, over to something that's more educational and relationship building. Everything that you see there on the screen is there for a marketing purpose. Uh, for the pilot, we've just used these uh, um, in-house um, available images that were cut from a video, but obviously for future uh, campaigns, what we'd like to do is have a very specific creative brief with uh, images that represent um, more of what we have found in the, the study and different angles and, and that sort of thing, but it's sufficient and worked well enough um, for the purpose for the pilot. We've given them some support around how to focus their copy, the toning that we need uh, to create so the text sounds a certain way uh, when it's when it's uh, read by the audience and also what our call to action is to make sure that there is always something that they can act on straight away to do what it is that we've asked them to do. Okay. 
Uh, similarly with the family group, um, Fish for Their Future. So that was a combination of the literature that we had read um, and also the results that we got back from the survey around what was important to fishers. And we thought, okay, let's test this out. If what, what is more important to them, the actual zoning connection with the reef or the connection with their children with the reef. And uh, um, th there's some good results on that that I'll leave to Matt because I know he's really excited about the results and wants to talk about those later. So you can see there we've done the same thing, softened up the message, kept the image constant between the A-B testing and just looked at the ordering and the type of messages when we did the, the testing. Okay, and in terms of the images, um, the best performing images makes love to see themselves. And I'll, again, I'll just gloss over this because I know Matt's got some really specific comments um, that have been drawn from social media. Um, the A-B testing, based, we didn't just base it on the click metrics. We actually um, used a combination of when they went through to the site, what did they do there, that they were there for an extensive period of time doing things whilst there. Um, so it's not just a click through rate. Okay, so people like to see themselves in this. They like to be in the group because they are the things that consistently are being reported as the reasons that they're out on the water and what they enjoy about being out on the water while fishing. Uh, okay, so our best performing creatives, you can see there um, for each of the three groups. And our um, no big surprise there, which is always nice when you run a, a bit of an experiment that Love the Reef worked out as the best uh, performing uh, messaging in relation to, well, both groups really, um, with Fish for Their Future being the component of the message most relevant to our family groups, which is exactly in accordance with the literature, our online surveys and the focus groups, which is always nice. Um, with the friends, I don't think we've really hit the mark with that messaging yet. I think they need something a little bit different. Um, and that could be, again, um, addressed in, in some other things that we're going to do following this. Excuse me, Tracy. Yep. Just letting you know this, you've got two minutes left. So no you might have to speed Matt? it up a little bit. Yeah, so what we might do, we might click ahead, um, Tracy, just to the uh, some of the comments. Um, so just to give you an idea, this was one of the really the really big aha moments for us in this campaign was the actual comments that we were getting. Um, so these are some of the existing comments that we had with our older messaging. Again, that sort of um, sort of more stick less carrot type messaging. And we we're getting a lot of pushback in the comments. So people saying green means go, the correct zone is any area below the surface, green for the go, all that sort of stuff. So our messaging was essentially being high Jacked. Um, and if you click back, Tracy, to some of the new comments, um, let's go back one more. Yep. So these are some of the, the general theme of comments we were getting. So it was people tagging their friends in the posts um, saying, is this you? Looks like you. And that was a really encouraging sign for us. So it essentially shows that where our messaging is hitting the mark with these groups um, and they're tagging their friends. So they're obviously relating to the posts a lot more. Um, and if you click through to some of the results, Tracy, as well, um, one of the other big findings for us that Overall, the B variations are far more effective in driving on-page actions. Um, so not people just liking the post, people actually downloading the maps and downloading the apps, which is what we're pushing more towards for that behavior change element. Um, so that was a really encouraging sign for us as well. And I guess the key learning again there is not to rely on the vanity metrics like reach uh, frequency, but to focus more on those on-page actions. And that came on the back of our B text or our softer, more emotional text that Tracy talked about earlier. Um, Catherine, do you want to talk about some compliance learnings if you have time? Yeah, just briefly, if you move to the slide. Um, but yeah, I won't keep you too long. But um, I mean, overall, it, improving our compliance communications has the purpose of trying to increase voluntary compliance. It's very difficult for us to still be able to manage it or uh, measure a, an actual behaviour change. But this project is really taking us closer to that point and really getting more effective campaigns and we're hoping that it will then translate to those outcomes um, on the water. Um, it has aided in understanding the recreational fishers and there's further um, and provided um, insight into non-compliance which we'll continue to build on to 
um, through our own data collection in the field, improving some of our processes and our um, offender interviewing and, and different um, projects to come, including um, the benefits that we're hoping to see from Stuart's work. But um, yeah, I think it's been a, a good step forward for us and, and we'll continue to um, try and progress it. But it's a complex space um, because people are complex, basically. Um, can you move on? Thank you. Over to Tracy again, I think. So this is where we're at at the project right now as a whole. Um, we're in the last stages and the final write-up. So as I said, we've got a few um, publications that are ready to go now. The report's in writing up, so we'll have a, a few items that we can obviously, um, as Michelle said, we could actually put up through your group to anyone that's interested. And yeah, you can contact the team about anything that you've seen very briefly um, today at any time. Thanks very much for your time today. Thank you um, for having us uh, give this talk or this uh, part of the part of this um, two hour um, thing. Um, very um, um, hopefully we'll be able to fit it into the 10 minutes, but Ruby and I are going to be presenting this together and we're going to be talking about a project that um, has just finished um, and the project's about what can the spatial and temporal and social factors tell us about the risk of recreational fishes, non-compliance in the Great Barrier Reef. So I'll start this talk and then Ruby will take over halfway and I'll try to keep clicking through it. Um, so what the project's about is basically to understand where, when and why recreational fishes don't comply with spatial zoning rules in the GBR. And there's um, three components, but the first two components, which I'll be talking about, is basically looking at uh, perceived spatial and temporal and weather factors that influence the recreation of fishes non-compliance. So we get this perceived information about the factors that contribute to this from the compliance officers. So we do what's called expert elicitation. And we also do observed spatial, temporal and weather patterns that influence recreational fish and non-compliance based on actual infringement data and patrol data. So we look at these facts and um, existing data and build a model around uh, risk factors. The third factor is um, what comes from the behavioral science um, knowledge and uh, based on recreational fishing types. And Ruby is going to talk about that after I talk about the first two. So. Um, as I said, we had some perceived, um, the importance of perceived factors in fisheries, non uh, recreational fishes, non-compliance. Um, and we did that using expert elicitation of compliance officers, uh, basically harvesting compliance officers' knowledge. We did 51 interviews with experts in 2022. And we basically tried to figure out how predictable um, compliance behavior was, how important the different temporal and spatial factors were in explaining non-compliance, and how certain um, the experts were about their answers in terms of the importance of these factors. Um, the response rate we had was 41%, which was reasonable. Um, we had a reasonable um, spatial coverage of um, field officers and experts um, uh, although we did miss out on two locations where we had no responses or no surveys completed. Um, so the first um, thing we wanted to know is how predictable recreational fisher non-compliance behaviour actually is in the, in the opinion of the experts. Um, and this is just showing two groups of experts. So experts who are regularly out in the field at the bottom and then experts who are only sometimes out in the field um, at the top as you can see, the blue and the green are highly and somewhat predictable are quite high, although you can see there that the experts who are regularly out in the field actually have a lower proportion uh, who think that it's highly predictable. So there's a little bit of difference between the two groups, but they do say that it's it's reasonably predictable. So. Um, in the opinion of the experts, we try to figure out which the relative importance of different uh, risk factors for non-compliance. Um, this um, graph here shows the relative importance um, with the longer bars being the higher uh, or more important thing. So at the top was wind speed. So that's interpreted like if the wind's high, um, there's fewer people out there, uh, which will reduce non-compliance. The, the 
proximity of shipwrecks um, increased, which is an on-water attraction. It basically increased the number of people present and will increase the holiday period. Again, increases the uh, presence of people. Um, again, um, more important in terms of a risk factor of um, non-compliance. Then there's swell height and reef proximity and all the other factors uh, that are listed there. You can look through yourself. There's uh, obviously uh, people aspects, access uh, facilities and geographic um, aspects in that list. So essentially what this is saying that um, we, it's, it's quite sort of straightforward when and where there are more recreational fishes, it means there's more risk of non-compliance. So it's density dependent um, or put simply recreational fishes they don't go out on bad days, um, which reduces their uh, density. They go out when they have time in the holidays and weekends, which increases density. They go to places they can access when the facilities um, and accessibility makes it possible, which increases density. And they hang out where the fish are, which is the shipwrecks and the reef, which increases density. So these are the, the, the order of importance in terms of the things that um, increase the risk of compliance in both a, a negative and a positive way. Then we um, asked them how certain they were about their estimates and the ones that are considered most important were also the ones that are um, they had the most confident in they had the most confidence in. So these are the six factors that are with the yellow stars. Um, so those were some of the factors that the experts reckoned were important. Then as I said in the first slide that we also, uh, derived um, model, we also did model derived risk factors. And basically in uh, trying to explain the model in, in one slide is we had the spatial distribution of patrol effort in the Grumpa, in the GBR. We also had the spatial distribution of poaching incidents in the GBR for the period 2016 to 2021, which enabled um, the creation of risk maps where these two obviously um, but on the basis of the spatial um, distribution of patrol effort and the spatial um, distribution of poaching incidents and the time at which they occurred, we could overlay that on um, uh, other maps that have um, environmental or human infrastructure or uh, weather um, information. So if you overlay these maps on a GIS map with, for instance, reef locations, the islands, the MPA boundaries, etc., you can come up with factors that um, give you an indication of the risk of non-compliance based on those um, GIS data sets. Um, and these show the, the risk of these factors, um, model-derived risk factors in that um, bar graph there. At the top, it says fishing capacity, which is basically at the density related um, factor. So you can combine those two. So these were the original um, expert derived uh, risk, risk factors of non-compliance um, or the importance of those. So that the two units aren't quite the same, but wind speed at the top, as you remembered, and um, shipwreck proximity as the second. The model didn't assess four of the um, the factors, but essentially what it's what the model said was that fishing capacity, so nearness to populated area, was the most uh, significant risk factor. Wind speed was the second, um, accessibility to third, and reef proximity to fourth. And there's the the rest. The relative um, size of those also indicates that in the model, um, it was really the risk factor was really driven by fishing capacity. So there's some notable differences between. Excuse modeling. me, Ingrid. Yeah. Just letting you know you've got two minutes left. Oh my God! I better get on to the next slide then. Um, so that was my bit, and I'll hand over to uh, Ruby now um, for this slide. Um, hi everyone. Um, yeah. So as Ingrid kind of went through a bit more of those external environmental factors, um, we thought a. Uh, about a little bit more that the human element was missing. So we went into a little bit of behavioral science information to answer some of those questions there about who the non compliers are, why they're not complying, and um, most importantly, what Grubumpa can do about it. Um, so we kind of put together this timeline with the help of some people from Grubumpa to um, show what tools they have access to 
to influence uh, wreck fishing behaviour and they know a little bit about the reach but not so much about how they expect it can actually um, influence behaviour. So we also have their campaigns and then next we've got um, around changes in monitoring, we'd expect increase in fines and expansion to different locations across the GBR to influence behaviour as well. And also um, some other external factors that weren't included in the model and the expert elicitations, things like COVID or major weather events. Um, so super quickly, um, we expect the different tools that Kabrumpa have to influence the different types of um, wreck fishes a little bit differently. We put them on this kind of scale of how engaged people are um, in environmental issues, say, and then also how informed people are in the uh, rules. We found this kind of a useful tool um, of how you can split up maybe how different uh, strategies that Garumpa have can influence different types of um, wreck fishing behaviour. I might just go to the last one of those slides, Ingrid, because I think we'll run out of time. Um, so we've got these four different types. And when we think about um, how different um, tools that Garumpa has, such as those campaigns, if you provide accidental fishers, um, uh, sorry, accidental non-compliers, uh, information through campaigns, you can move them to that top quadrant um, through informing them. And then you've got um, other sorts of campaigns around uh, norms and beliefs to build stewardship, could move people up into that corner, but we're not really too sure about it. Um, so the last um, slide I'll just quickly go through is thinking about some more of the gaps that we found, some more questions. Um, and the two main ones were that effectiveness, how effective are the tools that Kurumpa have in terms of changing behaviour? And one of the main things that we don't have is also how many people are actually out there. So we need that question answered as well to be able to create a, a full picture, I suppose. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ruby and Ingrid, that was great. And um, thanks to all the other presenters thus far as well, some good presentations, and I still managed to get something out of it, even though I've been involved in these um, projects. So it's really great. Um, did anyone have or questions to ask thus far? I haven't seen any questions in the chat, but um, put your hand up if you did have a question to ask. We've got a, a little bit of time now, about um, 15 minutes to chat through anything that, um, Anyone would like to ask? I can't believe there's no questions. It's gotta be something there. Um, Amanda? Hey everybody, great presentations. Um, I'm wondering about um, the dynamics of motivation. So we're, um, it seems like a lot of the presentations have focused on person level and investigating engagement or social norms at one point. And I'm just wondering, um, how much we would expect that to shift from when they're doing the study versus when they're making the decision to comply or not comply with the regulations. I'm just wondering if there's been stuff done around that or if any of these studies or others have, have looked into that um, point of action kind of thing. There's more, more discussion not targeted at anyone specifically, I guess. <laughs> Does anyone uh, want to respond to that in particular? Um... Ingrid or Tracy, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Or Ruby. No, okay. <laughs> um, so just to clarify your question there, so you're more talking about whether um, at, at a larger level, not at a person scale level? Uh, still at the person scale level, I was just, I'm wondering, like, if I'm asked about, like, engagement or awareness of the rules, you know, now, it's very different than um, maybe that same construct when I'm deciding to comply or not, when I'm, you know, drinking with my buddies or getting ready to go on the fishing boat. So I'm just wondering how how stable are those across those time points and what happens mm -hmm. 
you know, does it, does it translate into those behavioral decisions at that moment in time kind of thing? Hi, Amanda. Great question. I wish I had the answer for you. But the next phase in our project, what I would like to do is actually look at those um, behavioral interventions around that. And primarily, if we look at the compliance pyramid, which are those accidental and routine areas we'd be targeting, um, which is more along the lines of what you were talking about, um, we'd be looking at interventions targeted at shifting the behavior at that point in time. So there's little like basic things that are probably a few people here have already looked at a little bit and discussed around setting alarms, for instance, um, that aren't, you have to actually take an action to break from that systems one to systems two thinking and give you that space and time to actually change what you're doing. So things like a, a phone alarm where you have to actually turn it off. It doesn't just stop a little bit. Um, that sort of thing. I can't, I can't give to you. I don't. I want to answer you and uh, talk to you some more, but I can't give away the really good ideas because we'd really like to get some funding to do them. But yes, that is on the cards. Definitely. That's awesome. Thanks. Um, Sweet Hoon, I don't know if you've heard of her, but she'd be worth connecting with. Actually has um, kicked off this year a behavioral lab down in the University of Tasmania. Um, yeah, great resource, um, which is where we'd be running a lot of that stuff through. Great. Thank you. And uh, I think from our perspective, you definitely see a lot of change in that, you know, that people have the app, but, you know, you get in the moment and there's that, a lot of that accidental component of, you know, oh, there's fish biting over there or the weather's changed and, and things like that. So it's definitely been on our minds for a long time as to how you kind of combat that or get people to be cognizant of it in some way, um, whether it's through mm -hmm. alerts or whatever it's through um to um yeah make people aware in those moments tiny can we go to you thank you um great presentation uh, a little bit not surprised but certainly disappointed when you, you talk about the numbers of fishers out there that you don't know and obviously that's data that you do need to know i was kind of aware of that but didn't want to believe it um but i guess it's true so how can you change that? Who can change that? How do, how do you go forward to get that kind of data that you need to solve this problem? Sorry, Tony, were you meaning the actual um, number of fishers fishing or the non-compliant numbers? Fishers fishing. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think there's some projects that will even um, come today. There's a, a project that... Um, you know, we uh, spoke about the boat ramp camera project that I, I think um, will help to get to that. And we've got various projects underway um, to get closer to that point. Um, it's, you know, there's the special challenges and we've had um, a whole range of projects that we have done recently to try and um, capture better at a reef wide scale as to where people are at different times and, and what they're doing and stuff like that. So I'd say there is a variety of things in train in that way to gain that data. Good to hear, thanks. Are there any other questions? I see um, Josh has posted in uh, one in the chat um, for Tracy. In the first talk, I missed whether there were significant differences or large effect sizes between the A and the B treatments in terms of their behavior. Hi. Um, yeah, there were. So over, overall, um, we achieved a five-fold um, improvement on what the previous campaigns had been in terms of actual um, downloading and interaction with other resources on the site. We didn't focus on the app. There's a whole range of other issues that are outside the scope of our project in relation to that app. That was more of something we had to actually overcome than anything um, directly related to our project. Um, yeah, the, at the end of the day, to answer your question, um, very different groups enjoyed being presented with very different images and behaved differently once they were actually um, engaged with the resources and wanted different resources. So it would strongly support um, different approaches to those groups to effectively um, engage with them and relationship build with them rather than um, sticking with the current campaigns, which have obviously been successful, right? Because everyone knows that there is 
zoning. They might not know where it is, which is the next step. Okay, but they know that they're zoning. They know that there are rules. And now we know kind of where they are and where they like to hang out in terms of their contacts. So we haven't just looked at online stuff. We've actually, the guys have already, um, the team there looked at Fishing Australia and done different promos and, and that sort of thing as well. So, yeah, like I said, there's a, a whole lot of other things that we in 10 minutes we just couldn't cram um, in to tell you about, but um, we're really looking forward to the report coming out and hopefully uh, you'll enjoy it and find it useful as well. Then we move on to the next session then. Um, so we've got a, a range of presentations um, from the Queensland Department for Agriculture and Fisheries. I'll leave them to introduce themselves individually. Um, they're all quite short presentations. Um, Peter Schofield will, I think, kick off and we'll be sharing her um, slides for the duration. Thank you, Peter. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. Hi, everyone. I'll just get myself set up here. Excellent. Um, good afternoon. Thank you to the community for the invitation for us to come and present today. It's, um, it's really exciting to be part of this little event. Uh, there are four of us this afternoon from um, QDAF or Fisheries Queensland that are going to present on five different projects that we have happening in the recreational fishing space. Um, so I'll kick off and get us started with the first one. So. I'm Peter Schofield. I'm a senior project officer with our reporting information and digital solutions team in Fisheries Queensland. And I work um, quite strongly with engagement and client support for the use of our digital reporting systems. And I want to share with you a bit about this project we have happening at the moment. It's quite an exciting one, a very interesting one about um, recreational catch reporting using an app. So. I'll scoot through a bit about the why we're undertaking this project. So the results from our 2020 stock assessment uh, for Spanish mackerel triggered a change um, around the management arrangements for that particular stock and the public consultation uh, that was in place around that um, proposed management changes uh, asked that question about um, whether the respondents would support better recreational catch reporting. And the overwhelming uh, response from that was, yes, there, were, there is definitely a, a desire and support to have better recreational catch data specifically for Spanish mackerel in this instance. Um, and alongside that, part of our uh, sustainable fishery strategy reform is to have um, improved data collection and the use of novel technologies such as apps to be able to achieve that. And alongside that, we've also got um, shark depredation, which is a, a very key topic uh, around the country, especially in, in Queensland. And that's been identified as a key research area and a priority for Fisheries Queensland as well. So with those, those um, bits of information in mind, um, further consultation that, that happened around that Spanish macro, macro management change proposal. Um, some more questions that were asked were around that recreational catch reporting element of it and what sort of arrangement would be preferred. And our respondents also indicated to us that um, they would prefer a vol uh, sorry a voluntary um, arrangement for reporting that information to us rather than um, mandatory. Not too much of a difference, but still that one, that one came out as a preferred option. And also when we asked how we should do that um, in terms of implementation of the range of options we gave, the one that fell out as the most popular across the board was um, the use of a smartphone app. So that brings us to our what we're doing. So we currently have a recreational fishing app. Um, it was built by Fisheries Queensland with an external vendor. Uh, Queensland Fishing 2.0 has a range of um, awesome features in it currently, including some that are very relevant to the Great Barrier Reef area. Our idea is to build into that existing app some elements that allow that reporting mechanism to occur and making that, essentially making it a one-stop shop for fishers so they can still access all of those um, key bits of information within the app, but they can also go down the, the road of being able to report their catch details to us, uh, specifically around Spanish mackerel and shark depredation at this stage. 
in doing that and the challenge for us the key challenge for us is that it's in a voluntary capacity so obviously there's a lot of work that we need to do a lot of work we've already started doing around how we get people engaged and involved and um, willing to report their catch information to us in that voluntary capacity using an app so we do have um, plans to make that reporting structure nice and easy um, simple and user friendly but we also want to engage fishers in other ways and keep them um, wanting to do that reporting into the future. So we have plans to build in other elements into those enhancements, including the ability to be able to look back on their catch histories and, and um, integrate that with some condition-based reporting as well. So they have a, bit of, have a bit more of that information in their hands. We want them to be able to go back and look at their information in interesting and meaningful ways. So some the presentation of some statistics around their catch and perhaps how that um, is happening in comparison to others. And we also want to integrate some other features um, that en enable that social based sharing. Um, also for them to be recognized or perhaps rewarded in an app sense uh, for, the, for their contributions to the reporting. Um, that we can let them know and we can keep them informed of, of how they're progressing with that reporting and also link them up to extra information that that um, keeps them learning about their own information and what else is going on in that fishing world around them. So I'll round it out with one more slide. Our project timeline. So we've been we've been working on this for a little while already and we've done some um, some great planning and, and early stage project work where we've currently started our app development work with our external vendor. We've also undertaken um, a lot of fo a fair amount of focus group work already with recreational fishers to start collecting some information early on about um, how they may or may not like to use this app so that can inform our development. And we've also got a big piece of work ahead of us um, around market research for that behaviour change aspect for fishers as well and really trying to um, bed down how we're going to sell this to our recreational fishers and get them engaged in in reporting their information to us in that voluntary capacity. So we're due to deliver by the 1st of July next year. So we've got a big, big um, continued bunch of work ahead of us, but uh, it's, it's quite an exciting project to be working on. So yeah, happy to answer any questions we've got um, after the next speakers, but I'll pass on to Jessica, the next speaker. Thank you. Awesome. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, you're coming through. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, hi, so my name is Jess. Um, I work for the Recreational Fishery Monitoring Team at, Queens, at Fisheries Queensland. Um, so I'm going to run you through uh, two of our boat ramp um, survey programs that we have. Oh, thanks, Pete. Um, so Fisheries Queensland have been running the boat ramp survey program for more than 15 years across 48 boat ramps in Queensland. Um, so they go as far south as the Gold Coast um, and as far north as Weeper. Um, so we interview fishers when they're retrieving their boats um, and we ask them questions um, such as their kept and release numbers for the fish that they've caught. Uh, we measure their kept fish, so our staff are trained in identifying over 40 species that we monitor. And our fishing effort data um, we collect is where a person resides. So these are things like their postcodes where they live, um, what species they were targeting at the time of their trip, and what regions that they go fit, that, that they fished. So this program relies on building rapport with fishers as the survey is voluntary. So we try to keep these survey questions as easy and as quick as possible. So it's something that should be quite easy while they're trying to pack up their boat, um, get everything ready to leave the ramp. Um, so we actually, we have a really high participation rate for this, uh, for this program, it's over 95%. Um, oh, next slide, please, Pete. Thanks. Um, so a way with, that we can give back to the fishers um, that we interview is by having this online um, public dashboard. So this showcases our data uh, that we collect from, um, from them at the boat ramp. So, this is an open data policy. It's easy to use and free to the public. So participate, participants can view what, data, what their data is being used for. Um, we often get questions at the ramp um, asking where their data is being used. And this is quite an easy way that they can visualize it. Um, so 
This is an example for common coral drought catch. So on the left hand side, you can see that there's filters. Uh, so you can filter by year, um, what species you're interested in, which fishing, uh, fishing method that you use. So if you went um, spearing or uh, potting or line fishing, um, and which fishing region that you're fishing in. So yeah, it's quite a nice, easy way that people can view their own data. Um, next one, please, Pete. Oh, oh, there it is. <laughs> um, so the, other, the next project I wanted to talk to you about is our new pilot study that's underway at the moment in the Castellary Coast. So there's a few different components to this project. So there's machine learning cameras that will be installed at boat, boat ramps to record boating effort. So these, this is recording boats being launched and retrieved. Um, aerial imagery uh, will also be used to understand the proportion of total boating effort in the region by counting trailers at those smaller boat ramps um, that we don't have the cameras on. And then our face-to-face -face boat ramp surveys will estimate the proportion of boats uh, fishing and their catch rate, um, that, oops, sorry, which will allow us to estimate harvest. So the cameras will be visible, obviously, at the boat ramp. So this is a, steward, a stewardship obstacle to overcome at the time. There will be signage at the boat ramps, um, letting people know what's happening with the, um, and that, that there is cameras there. Um, but no matter which project Fisheries Queensland uses, for example, the, the boat ramp survey program or the, the voluntary reporting rep fishing app, they'll all be improved by the willing participation of recreational fishers. So enhancing this willing participation um, re sorry, requires fisher education on the importance of their data. So promoting the behaviour of fishers to want to report their data to us um, is very important. So this isn't a quick or easy process, I'm sure everyone's aware, um, but it will be beneficial for all the programs that we have running for Fisheries Queensland. Um, yeah, that's all from me. <laughs> Um, so I guess I just shoot. So my name's Amos Mabelston. I'm a fisheries biologist within the fishing fisheries monitoring team. Um, principally, I'm responsible for collecting data on uh, other species, which includes deep water lujanids, red emperor, subtle tail snapper, crimson snapper, but also spangled emperor. So I'm just going to run through some of the strategies we use to collect. Um, catch samples, recreational catch samples to be used as biological samples within the monitoring program. Next one, Pete. So the fishing monitoring program collects data principally to look at the status of fisheries, not only within the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, but statewide. So we rely on representative length samples from the commercial sector, but biological samples, including otoliths um, and sex information, and um, we'll take that from all sectors within the fishery. Um, the need for recreational catch sampling in the north within the marine park has been driven by reduced participation in the monitoring program from commercial sector due to management changes within the fisheries, but also the difficulty of collecting biological sam samples as um, markets change. So the introduction of fishers um, selling their, their product and selling it as whole iced means that we, we don't have the chance to actually take odorless from samples. So within the recreational sampling space, we use um, sites, drop sites, where fishers can donate samples. And these are structured around key fishing times and around key species. So using Caramine Beach to collect spotty mackerel at this time of year really is the primary way that we collect, we can sort of most efficiently collect those samples. We use fishing competitions to sample catches and we also recruit anglers for the Keen Angler Program. And I'll sort of talk about more. So, in terms of sampling recreational catches, this has the 2019 catch figures in tons for the commercial sector and the recreational catch sector. 
and the recreational catch share of that total harvest. And you can see that recreational catch share for these species, saddle tail snapper, red emperor and crimson snapper is much larger. So it's a go-to for collecting biological samples. Next one, Peter. So obviously looking at that last slide, recreational sector is an obvious place to look for um, samples to include in monitoring the status of fisheries. Um, we understand that collecting samples from the recreational sector can be costly. So we're working on strategies that sort of maximize the number of samples we'll get or minimizing the number of resources we have to sort of um, use to collect these samples. So part of that strategy is working through networks. So fishing networks, engaging with fishers who we know catch fish, fish regularly, and also through the use of the targeted drop sites like we have in Caramine Beach. There's also a strong focus on engagement with recreational fishers. And this is primarily through fishing competitions, but also through the Keen Angler program as well. Uh, next one, Pete. So how effective has this been? So the green highlights the contribution of the commercial sector for otoliths over the past three years. And you can see that we have slowly seen the number of odalis contributed from the commercial sector drop off. But over the years, we have seen an incre increase in contribution from the Keen Angler program, which is the recreational sector. In the Keen Angler program in the north, of the, in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park area, was only started in October 2022. And you can see there in the recent financial year, the mix is very different. Um, there are also issues around targeting. So you can see that while saddle tail snapper, we have got a lot of odalis for that species. For other species that aren't targeted as much by recreational fishers, we haven't seen as much contribution. So these are the primary species we're monitoring within the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. And this little card is also sort of highlighting sort of things we're using to, I guess, get the message out about the program and get the message out about fisheries monitoring, what we do, why we do it, and how it works for monitoring the status of fisheries. So there's a little QR code there in the corner. So it's just about getting the message out and giving fishers feedback, really important for the program. So in terms of getting the message out about the program, there is also a newsletter associated with the Keen Angler program, and it's deliberately informal and approachable for people donating frames and involved in the Keen Angler program. Um, it's about developing a sense of ownership for those fishers involved in the program. So we will include things like their photos in the program, talk about um, catches, uh, seasons for fishing, and just give updates on tallies of numbers of fish we've been collecting. Yep. So yeah, that's it for sort of some background about the recreational catch sampling program. Thanks. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'll kick off. Um, so my name's Emily. Um, I'm the Senior Education Officer in the Shark Control Program at DAF. Uh, and I will be giving you an overview of our Shark Smart Behaviour Change Project. Um, and that focuses on fishing and the disposal of fish waste. Uh, so the Shark Control Program runs our Do Your Part Be Shark Smart campaign, and that's aimed at reducing the risk of shark bites across Queensland. Uh, and one of the key behaviours in that campaign that we're trying to influence is to keep fish waste and food scraps out of the water where people swim. So the fish waste project that I'm talking about today really focuses in on that um, behaviour and changing that behaviour within the wreck fishing community. 
Uh, so in terms of some drivers for the project, um, there's strong evidence that fish waste in the water, as well as fish at catch, can attract sharks to an area and then impact swimmer safety. And then just looking at the GBR region in particular, um, the shark incidents at Northwest Island in 2019 um, and 2020, human behaviour and scraps disposal was identified as an issue there. And there's also been some research undertaken uh, in the Whit Sundays with bare boat hire customers just around throwing food scraps overboard. Um, and one of the recommendations from that project was to ex expand the behaviour change to wreck fishers in particular. So for this project, there's two key markets that we're looking at, um, and that's wreck fishers in both the Whit Sundays uh, and Moreton Bay, which is in southeast Queensland. Uh, and this is because both of those regions have high water traffic and high potential for that co-location of fishing and swimming behaviours. Just next slide, please, Peter, thank you. Um, so phase one um, is now complete, uh, and that really focused on that sort of formative research um, to understand the different attitudes, beliefs and motivations um, and the current behaviours of wreck fishers in those two regions. And the methodology was quite comprehensive. So uh, we did an initial review. Um, we conducted some fish along interviews with wreck fishers. So they were both while they were fishing um, as well as when they returned from their trip. We did a number of stakeholder consultations um, with industry and government representatives. And we also conducted a benchmark quant survey around the attitudes and beliefs and behaviours. Uh, and so from there, we were able to develop up some um, proposed intervention and messaging approaches, which we were then able to test via a number of focus groups as well with fishers. So just an overview of some of the key findings. Um, we found that the scale of undesired behaviour wasn't at all widespread. Um, so most of the time fishers were really doing the correct behaviour. It was only in particular occasions or situations. So for example, where there's co-location of those activities that pose that greater risk. And we also found that fish, fish waste disposal behaviours are ingrained habits. So essentially something that fishers have learnt when they were young, learnt from their parents um, and have just grown up doing. So it was really important that, that providing that sort of alternate way to dispose of fish waste needed to be specified. Otherwise they would really default back to what they knew and what they learned as kids and what they'd been doing growing up. So overall we found that fishers were predominantly in that pre-contemplation stage of behaviour change. So largely unaware that there's an, there's an issue, um, meaning that our first step then um, in the intervention was to essentially make them aware and move them into that contemplation stage. So next slide, thanks, Peter. Um, so to do that, uh, the recommended behaviour change strategy um, put forward was to pilot an awareness and education campaign targeted to wreck fishers in the Sundays and Moreton Bay regions. So the objectives of the campaign are to essentially make fishers aware of the issue, help them then to identify when and where they might need to reassess their behaviour, so what situations that's, that's required, uh, and then to clarify what that desired behaviour is and provide some alternatives so that they can change their behaviour if needed. And the research identified that the most effective and credible way to frame that messaging for fishers was to show them that there was changes in the hobby or in the marine environment or locations, for example, or research and science over time. And then that map may require them to um, change the way that they actually dispose of their fish waste. And it was really important um, to the fishers to provide evidence behind that. Uh, so where to from here? So um, phase two will involve scoping out exactly what that campaign looks like. So that includes the messaging, the stakeholder engagement, 
um, the delivery channels, um, some proposed channels, as you can see on screen, um, some advertising through social and digital um, and in situ sort of locational channels and partnerships with potentially fish, fishing personalities, different communities and programs like the Keen Angler program, um, like Amos was talking about earlier. So once we've done that, we'll um, look at testing the concepts with um, a group of the, the stakeholders and then roll out the pilot over approximately six to eight months. And then we'll look at evaluating it, obviously against um, those benchmarks from the research that we conducted in phase one. And then moving forward, um, we'll aim to incorporate that messaging and the findings into our broader shark smart campaign um, across Queensland. So I think that's that's probably it from me. Thank you very much, and thanks to um, everyone who's presented from um, QDAF. Um, some great presentations there, um, and great projects, and keen to continue to be involved um, in things moving forward um, as they go. Um, I see there's already some questions in the um, in the chat, so I'll move to those first off. And if others have questions, feel free to um, put your hand up as well. Um, so this first one's for Peter. Um, it's it's regarding the app, um, and uh, there is a comment about a great app, um, and it has been useful. So I also second that. Uh, it says, in regards to getting greater voluntary uptake of the app and more complete reporting, you mentioned things like providing data feedback. Um, are there any other novel ideas being thrown around on how to achieve high overall levels of reporting? I imagine some ideas would revolve around creating social norms, promoting use of the app, building a strong stewardship ethic across recreational sector, etc. Can your team mention any more of where you're thinking maybe going around building the stewardship ownership more widely? I also note there's a second comment and maybe team up with Coast Guard and promote it when people sign up for Coast Guard towing memberships. I know, Peter, we've also talked about maintaining people within the game and, and sort of trying to get them to stay on using, or, or not stay within the game, but using different mechanisms to um, help them to stay with it and continue reporting, but uh, maybe you can talk to that about, uh, you know, how you're uh, gaining people and then sort of maintaining it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great questions. Thank you so much for bringing those ones um, to the forefront there. Um, there's probably not a lot I can tell you right now about how exactly we plan to do that. And that's, that's definitely where we'll be looking at our market research of recreational fishers over the next um, six plus months to be able to really drill down into what it is based on fisher feedback that is going to be most effective for us to achieve that. And we have a lot of thoughts around that already ourselves and based on other jurisdictions experiences, both in Australia and overseas, we've had some really great inputs about things that have been shown to work and not work. Some of them are very novel um, others, we're dipping our toe in the water with things like gamification um, and different concepts like that. Obviously, it's a it's a data collection um, platform, so we need to be careful about how we may introduce that into something like an app. But we do also understand that in order to engage, especially on a voluntary basis, that we do need to pull some of those levers. So um, watch this space. I'm really hoping I can come back to you at some point in the future with some more detail around what exactly that will look like. But um, there's definitely plenty on the table and we're very keen to engage in as many different avenues as we can. So things like the Coast Guard are a brilliant, brilliant idea. We also have a lot of other existing channels like um, you've just seen Amos presenting about something like the Keen Angler program as well. We've got lots of other avenues and, and groups that we, networks that we work with in an existing capacity that we um, will be definitely trying to work alongside to get that interest and uptake. But um, as you can see, for a lot of the other behaviour change projects that we've been talking to today, it's a it's a long game. It's a, the end game is is long. It's not a not a quick thing to change people's behaviour and to do it in a way that's going to stick into the future. Um, so yeah, there's there's a fair amount of I guess pressure around that as well because we don't want to see something this good um, not go well. So we're very committed and invested in in getting the answers and going to the end users to get that information. So 
I yeah, I can't give you too much more detail than that at this point about what that specifically looks like. But if anything to take away is that we're definitely um, planning to do a lot more work in that space over the next few months to work out what that looks like for us. Hopefully that helps. Great. Right. Thank you, Fida. No, that was good. Um, Tassi and Michelle, um, I'm not sure if there is a bit of a question exchange going on there. I don't know if you want to ask that one verbally or I'll leave you to hash that out over there. If you did want to pipe up, Michelle. Um, yeah, I just, my question really came because I was looking at Amos presented. He, he had a table there that showed proportion of catch of particular species coming from wreck fishing and commercial fishing. So I was just kind of thinking about how you were having high confidence in the wreck fishing catch when one of the issues we saw in a previous presentation was not really knowing how many wreck fishes were out there. So I was just trying to figure out how these pieces of information fit together. These are the only pieces of information we have if that makes sense. Yeah, that um, was my confidence question then. So I was like, you know, okay. how, what's your and confidence? I guess, what do you think, you, what proportion do you and think, sorry, Tyson, the you're catching? Yeah. And Tyson is there to sort of further that. I guess that's the background behind the boat ramp surveys and moving towards these sort of programs. So Tyson or Jessica can talk about that, but these are the um, estimates that we have. Um, for recreational catch from 2019 from the statewide recreational fishing surveys. So, yeah. Tyson, I see you put your video up. Did you want to further respond? You're on mute, Tyson. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Um, so good questions, Michelle. Um, so the way that we estimate recreational harvest is, um, is changing at Fisheries Queensland. So what we used to do and pretty much every fisheries management authority around uh, Australia and the world is use telephone diary surveys where um, fishers log their catch throughout a year and then we use some demographic information about um, what we know about the population to expand harvest uh, to expand those um, diary catches into harvest estimates for species estimates of participation etc etc except um, people don't really like filling in surveys as much as they did 10 years ago they're not as novel um, and there's a high likelihood of um, people not wanting to fill in surveys because they might be a scam as well. So participation rates in those types of surveys has dropped off a lot. And um, Fisheries Queensland are in the fortunate position where we can now try and move to other um, methods, which is pretty much what Jess described, where if we can understand how much boating effort there is, um, we can pair that with information that comes from our boat ramp survey program, which is a established long running program, which no other state actually has at that scale um, to basically understand how many fishing trips are happening and how many fish are being caught per trip. It should, in theory, provide us with better participation estimates of fishes and better um, estimates of harvest at smaller scales as well, because one of the problems with those diary type surveys is they work quite well when you've got lots of people participating because you can estimate, um, have relatively narrow confidence intervals on that. Um, but as soon as you uh, bring that down to like a regional scale and then an even smaller scale, um, you might only have one replicate in there, which means you've got no confidence in that data. Um, so that's why we're transitioning towards testing out this pilot study. And the idea is that that would eventually um, be expanded across the whole state where we put cameras on the busy boat ramps. We estimate the missing um, percentage of um, boating effort using um, things like the, sorry, I can see questions coming up that are distracting me, but um, the missing percentage using aerial surveys. So we can't obviously put a camera at all 400 ramps, but we can put them on the very busy ones and then use some aerial surveys to model that missing fishing effort. And then we've got the voluntary app that Peter um, described as well, hopefully telling us um, data on catch rates in areas where we're not doing boat ramp survey programs and at times when we're not doing boat ramp surveys. And that should, if you can piece all that together, that should give us an improved harvest estimate and an improved participation estimates for recreational fishing. 
Great, thanks Tyson. I think that you've also maybe covered off on Simon Miller's question, which was about without the diary program and reliance on boat ramp surveys, how do you capture uh, land-based wreck fishes in the diary? No, okay. He's got a very good um, question there. We haven't forgotten that some species are caught, um, obviously from land. Um, and some of them are mostly caught from land, like Taylor and Barramundi. Um, so that's where this voluntary app becomes really useful, I think, because it will give us data on, um, for example, whether people are fishing from boats or from shore, um, depending on the species that they're catching. So if, in a very um, pretty rough rough sense, if we knew that we had, fifth, uh, we had a boat ramp Sorry, we had a harvest estimate um, using the cameras and boat ramp surveys for Barramundi, but we could see that from the voluntary app that we we're missing about say 50% of the people um, that were reporting were actually fishing from the shore. It would give us an idea of just how much we're missing by missing out those, um, the by not having uh, measuring that shore-based fishing. We've also got other ideas on how to do that. For example, um, for Taylor, um, most of the beaches that they're caught at are pretty obvious and we could potentially do creel surveys that we expand um, by doing a stratified survey design there, so. Great, thank you. Um, Tony, I might go to you next. Uh, thanks. And again, thanks to those four presenters. They're really interesting topics. Uh, I'm amazed they were able to keep their time frames to what they were because I'm sure that they could go on and on. I've got two questions and uh, I'm not sure they're entirely relevant or even possible to answer. So just consider it my curiosity. And I, anybody wants to have a go at these, but there's a lot of talk here. It's kind of following on from what Michelle was talking about, confidence in your catch data. Um, there's a lot of talk about shark depredation and I've heard from lots of local fishermen, commercial recreational, that they lost, you know, this is just them talking, they lost half a catch to the bloody sharks. So when it comes time to count the fish that have been removed from the environment on that day, uh, are we only counting the fish that come back to shore? Or is there some way, don't ask me how, that you would take into account the fish that got eaten by a shark that has been removed from the environment and I guess should be looked at as harvest. Um, I think that's probably a question for you, Amos, perhaps, or Tyson, do you wanna answer that one? Yeah, I can have a go. So we've just added the um, shark depredation, a shark depredation question to the boat ramp survey program um, in anticipation of trying to improve that data. Um, there's a couple of, and we're also adding it to the recreational fishing app that Peter's described. Um, one of the tricks with that is that um, if people are reporting, only reporting trips that where they've actually caught fish and not had an instance um, where a shark, sorry, if people are encouraged to only report trips where sharks have eaten their catch, we're gonna sort of get, um, we're gonna miss the true zeros so we'll get the data from the rec app as well as from the boat ramp survey program where it doesn't matter if they're um, logging on to a report of their own volition, we're going and talking to them after they got out of the water. So that should give us a good indication of um, how accurate that app data is coming in. And um, I'm not a stock assessment scientist, but the, hopefully we could potentially use that in some way to um, understand just how, how Big that problem is and whether we need to add a mortality factor onto um, the stock assessment for additional uh, fish mortality in addition to harvest. So. Well, thanks, Tyson. That's, that's, that's really good news. And I'm glad I'm not just being silly thinking about the impact of shark depredation. That my second question is almost, it's along a similar line. And I guess, Tyson, you might want to deal with it again. Uh, the catch and release data that, we, that, that is used, and again, catch keep goes into the harvest numbers release doesn't i assume but then there could be i don't know for a fact but i know there is some mortality with fish that are released is there some factor you build in to take that into account yeah so we we record um kept and released fish on all of our programs um generally there's quite a bit of published research on mortality um for key species so 
um, there'll be actual scientific studies that have gone out and measured um, mortality um, on fish as they're released. That information generally gets used quite a bit in stock assessments to do that um, to do that uh, sort of offset. Um, but again, we've got the catch and the kept and release numbers coming in from our programs, which can help us understand just how much extra um, sort of mortality there might be for species that are caught and released often with high mortality. So, great, thank you very much. Crystal clear. Thank you. Great questions. Um, and uh, perhaps uh, one for Tyson or someone else. Um, this is more of a broader question about um, don't fishers have to bring all the catch back to the boat ramp hole? Can someone from DAF answer that question? So, yeah, not filleted or the fillets have to be over the length of the minimum legal size. I think that's that's the thing, but best to look into the Wreck Fishing Queensland app 2.0. <laughs> that's your best answer for any of these questions. So everybody download it and have a look. Nice plug there. Uh, Jeffrey, did you have further question you wanted to ask there on that? Well, and I think I think I wanted to bring that question back around to because it, it came to me out of the um, the uh, the fish waste program and about people being concerned about fish scraps being dumped overboard by wreck fishes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I I hadn't had enough look at the app and didn't realise that you could do some filleting. Um, out at sea or out on the water, which uh, was curious, but from a local government perspective, all the fish coming back and the scraps being dealt with on, on land uh, become an issue for us from a waste management point of view at the same time. That was more a comment than anything else. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and unless anyone else has uh, anything they wanted to further add to um, what we just said as a comment, then we'll move on to you, Tracy. Thank you. Hi, just probably a bit of a combination and making sure that I'm getting the right sense of what everyone's been saying and reading a little bit between the lines today. One thing we didn't get to speak about our project um, for today's presentation was that um, in our focus groups and also in our surveys, we had a really strong sense of um, fishers actually wanting to do the right thing. And also that they actually wanted a lot of the projects. We actually did a like a workshop project question where they were asked to nominate what things they would want done in terms of improving the situation with compliance and the things like the boat ramp surveys and making sure that the officers were really visible and interacting with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis, not just on the water, but on shore. So there is a lot of goodwill out there and intention to do the right thing, I think, that we need to acknowledge and um, obviously harness for our purposes as well. But it seems like that's the same sort of thing that's coming through the other projects. And I was just wondering if others felt the same way um, that we're collecting data from that wreck fishing group. Peter, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I might just briefly make a comment. Thank you, Tracy. Um, definitely an observation that we've made, and Catherine, that you know, we've we've been working um, closely. We were introduced a few months ago, um, specifically around we're doing very similar things in this space about trying to understand wreck fishes and their behaviour, and these longer term behaviour change projects, including the Shark Smart one as well. And there's often key bits of information that. We're very keen to not duplicate if we're investing you know money into things like market research that there are things that we already know that we some we can confirm by testing that again in other ways but um, we're very much trying to leverage on making sure that we're talking to other jurisdictions and hearing their experiences as well and their research findings so that you know when yeah we're not reinventing the wheel but we're trying to work with what what we do know from all of that hard work and investment already so um, it's been really heartening and a great part of the project to, to do a lot more of that collaborative work across jurisdictions to make sure that we're all kind of heading for that same end goal, but also recognising that 
part of the driver for this particular rec, um, rec out reporting enhancement work is that Fishers told us through consultation that that's how they wanted to do it and that that was the arrangement that they wanted to do it in as a voluntary capacity. So we're trying to really connect back with this is how, like when we asked you, this is how you said you would prefer to do it. So we're trying to, I guess you would say, honour that by creating something in a way that they've already told us they would prefer to use it, which hopefully makes that next step a bit easier. But I, I do agree with you. I think there is probably a lot of interest out there and, and a lot of that theme about wanting to look after things for the future as well and to be involved. But we also recognise that some people are just human and they need more to drive them towards that behaviour change. And as Catherine mentioned, people are complex <laughs> and very hard to understand even when we try our best to do so. So um, yeah, it, it is probably good to, to get that message out there that we are trying to work with what we do already know and to try and leverage off other agencies and share that approach as well. And I think that one of the um, really great things in your project, Peter, is really how you have been doing it, um, designing it from the start in that way. I think a lot of the time in the past, we've really tried to retrofit some of the things on and change apps or change um, how we do things rather than go, well, how do you actually want to do this? And like, let's build it right from the start and how you're doing things. So I, I think that's um, a really great part of that project. Awesome. Thank you. Um, if anyone else wanted to comment on that or um, Michelle will uh, go to you. Thanks, Catherine. This is a, a general question. I don't know who's best placed to answer it, but I just wondered off the back of both what Tracy and Peter just said, um, in some of the projects I've been aware of, there's talk of it might only be a small percentage of people that are, are the persistent non-compliers, but we don't know what's the proportionate effect on the fish on the fishery. So I just wondered if anybody involved in all of this different work has any sense of, okay, if it's just a small percentage of non-compliers, is it having a really massive disproportionate effect on the health of the fishery if we have a lot of people willing and, and potentially complying? Uh, I might start that one and then others can kick off further if they wish to as well. And I mean, I know, Michelle, we've talked about it in that um, it's very difficult to, I guess, gauge some of the intentional non-compliance, the, the full um, rate of it, because, um, you know, if you're intentionally non-complying, you're, you're trying to often, um, you know, be uh, not where um, enforcement agencies are and things like that. And it's not that we don't catch people uh, intentionally non-complying, we do. Um, but to consider the size of that group and then consider what the impact is in the fishery is difficult. Um, we then, you know, we are looking at doing um, greater um, sort of uh, to gain get greater understanding of that intentional group through our processes and how we're doing things. I'm talking around it a little bit and it's difficult to say um, exactly what we're doing there, but we um, are looking to focus more on that and understanding the group size. We do want to understand the group size of all the varying groups of, you know, if, whether they're accidentally uh, non-compliant or whether they, um, you know, have some level of intentionality, but not really into like um, whether they just, you know, will duck in on occasion or whether they'll accidentally go due to weather or, or whatever and figure out those different sizing, like um, the nest work has helped us to sort of get closer to. Um, but it is difficult to understand those groups. And so we are trying to get um, further and further to understand the size to then help to understand the impact. Um, there are varying levels of impact that you might have with the intentionality as to depending on, um, you know, if people are trying to black market or, or whatever um, they're trying to do. Um, but yeah, I, I can go to others in, in what um, people think um, the impact of intentional non-compliance is overall versus, I guess, the um, accidental or, or non-intentional kind of aspects. And maybe someone with the fisheries might want to answer um, or give input into that. There are any takers, maybe? Maybe I'll have to say that. I would agree that it's a very, very hard one to quantify. And 
in a lot of our sampling strategies that we implement and our activities that we conduct, including things like the boat ramp survey program, it's really hard to come across that. So we have a really high participation rate up in the high 90% across the board for those surveys, but we don't have the opportunity to speak to every fisher. Some fishers that are doing the wrong thing are probably quite sneaky and would probably try to get past us before we even talk to them. But remembering that our, our scientific and monitoring team, they don't have any authority to act under the under the, our regulations. So um, even if we were suspicious that something was going on to be able to quantify that there was some kind of non-compliant behaviour happening, that's not the realm of our um, our data collection team. So it's a, it is a tricky one when you're talking about compliance versus and collecting data. And then if that if that heads over to the compliance team, it's also a tricky one to be able to do. And then somehow compare that to um, in a clear way to the ones that we know are compliant. It's yeah, it's quite an interesting question, but yeah, I don't know if we have a real specific answer on that one. And unfortunately, they don't tell you that they're being non-compliant. <laughs> we do pick up on some of that incidental, like you know, you're not, you know, someone's got the wrong size in their mind. They don't have the app with them, so they don't know what size they're supposed to keep. Or some of that incidental non-compliance that we do come across in those surveys. But yeah, I just don't think we see a lot of that real intentional stuff because people are being very intentional about not being seen. So um, hard for us to quantify. We don't try to quantify that in our current monitoring work as well. Um, just to add a little bit to what Peter's saying is separate to that compliance issue, just through the work that we're doing, the engagement with the fishery and fishers helping us out with the monitoring program. There's a lot of fishers that are really keen to get engaged and um, contribute to understanding the status of fisheries. So I guess it's separate to that issue, but just sort of a takeaway note from something like the Keen Angler Program that in the South has been running since 2002. It just shows there's a large group of fishers there that are really keen in the status of fishery and want to status of fisheries and want to contribute in a meaningful way. So I just wanted to make that point too. I think we're um, almost at time here and uh, it looks like everyone's questions in the chat, I think have been answered. It's a bit of a hectic chat right now. Um, lots of answers flying around from um, Dad. So thanks for that. Um, if no one has that one, I guess, more brief um, burning question, I'll hand over to Michelle to wrap things up for us. 